Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. as a battle-proven entrepreneur in multiple industries with extensive knowledge in sports industry. Please welcome the CEO of Life Grows Green, Chad Price. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Chad Price. Chad, how are we doing? Doing great today. How about yourself? Good. In fact, I'm I'm very interested in this conversation because you have done a lot of things in your entrepreneurship career. Before we get into all that, let's introduce the world. Who is Chad Price? Give us a little background. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm a seasoned entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I jumped into entrepreneurship about 10, 12 years ago and have started several companies, my most notable being Kettlebell Kings, which is a, a iconic fitness brand in the in the kettlebell and the fitness space. Um, my latest venture, Life Grows Green, is a lifestyle brand around natural products like, you know, hemp derived products, uh, natural supplements, uh, natural lifestyle products, really anything that uh, is derived from nature versus, you know, uses pharmaceutical or plastics or, or you know, anything that's kind of uh, not a natural substance. And, you know, also since, um, I started the journey with Kettlebell Kings about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, 2012. And so we sold that company in 2021. And I'm really just kind of transitioned to my next chapter with uh, my other two companies and starting my first book. Nice. So let's let's talk about Life Grows Green. What What is Life Grows Green? Life Grows Green is a it's kind of a culmination of, you know, I would say my entrepreneurship journey. Um, I've owned several different companies and over throughout that journey, I've really gotten to build communities and see what types of services people like to purchase, especially in my fitness journey, uh, with my fitness companies. One of the things that I think is lacking in the, in our world and in the space is products or companies that, that try to create products from natural things and, and from what, what we can derive from earth. And, you know, I think that's the ultimate goal of Life Grows Green is really to create a lifestyle brand around those types of products. So you have stigmatized products and stigmatized plants like cannabis and hemp um, that, you know, we'll focus on and and uh, provide products around that culture and, and kind of the healthier lifestyle that uses that you can you can make from those products. But then even the the things that you use in your day to day when you're talking about the sheets that you use, you know, you're talking about. Um, the types of dishware that you use, um, your, you know, the supplements that you put in your body, all of these are different things that can be derived more naturally than we currently use. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting point because I just recently uh, read a report on the Portland Business Journal because I'm out here in Oregon and they were talking about the different states and the amount of, um, amount of crop that, that's actually dedicated to hemp. And it's yeah. been increasingly year over year. Uh, except for last year, I think a lot of them, I think that the production was still the same, but I don't think they made as much revenue, but I think that's kind of safe to say almost in this industry on almost every level, right? But it's interesting because you're starting to see this need for alternative, um, um, you know, products like hemp. And now this is a very new and novel kind of industry. What What have you... What are some of the things that you're kind of learning that you're going through this process? You're like, wow, I didn't know I had to worry about this. I mean, I, I, I think I knew what I had to guide myself into when I started this. So luckily for me, I, you know, I did some research prior to kind of getting into this. And, you know, I like taking, taking on tough challenges, to be honest. Um, you know, right now, the most difficult thing is in advertising in this space, especially if you're talking about hemp and cannabis. You know, it's treated with the the, you know, the most extreme level uh, of discrimination basically online by, by every single company. And then even companies that do try to legalize some form of promotional material or, or marketing, you know, they're going to have different standards. And, uh, you know, at any given moment, you can be kicked off the system or, or flagged. And it's the, the risk 
greatly outweighs the reward of these types of systems. And it, you know, I think it starts with the governments and with the laws of, uh, from state to state, from you know, literally county to county in a lot of places where you just don't have consistency and people aren't allowed to really compete on a, let's say, a level playing field in this space right now. Yeah, and I agree. And I, I, again, I don't quote me, but from what I read from this article, it does sound like uh, the federal government is starting to look at CBD and hemp and, and possibly yeah. uh, come out with findings of the positivity around it from the from a health perspective. Again, this is this is what I'm reading in the Portland Business Journal, folks. Don't quote me, but it is a it's a new, very new and novel. And I, I believe that there is some benefits, at least what from what we're seeing from the data. But how do you build a business with so much, you know, difficulty from the advertisement space from from getting it out? How did you build this? I mean, I think that's where where you know the other lifestyle products come in as well. You know, I I don't look at the hemp plant or the cannabis plant as you know a singular item that that exists in you know in some type of void. It's it's a part of a bunch of different plants from nature that we can use to derive products that can help our journeys, whether that's recreational, um, you know, healthy ways to to relieve anxiety and stress, or you know if that's ways that you want to use it to supplement nutritional uh, benefits or. Uh, workout routines, you know, like I was saying before, even even the cookware you that you currently use could be um, basically, you know, made in a more natural way. There's there's a there's a, a growing community of people, I believe, who are really shifting back towards trying to use products and uh, and use things that are derived from nature versus, you know, like I say, the commercialized or pharmaceutical way that we're approaching things lately. Now, since you're so kind of diversified. Right. You, you, you mentioned you can you can consume it. You can it can be a lotion. It can be a clothing item. It can be a dishware. What and it's so new. Right. And novel. What kind of requirements? What what are you having to go through to get it approved to sell? Like what 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 do you, what do people that going through this industry have to think about? Sure. I mean, if if you're talking about specifically the hemp products, you know, you have a lot of um, different options. So. There are quite a few different manufacturers who will sell you products that come with lab reports. So, you know, you can get those small batch lab reports from each one of your products. And, you know, that's kind of the way that we're forced to do it. You know, unfortunately, you know, I think it's a good thing to have lab reports, but I think when you force this industry to, you know, be more, uh, when you scrutinize it more than you scrutinize the alcohol industry or any other industry that, would would be consumed as a you know for recreational purposes or uh, some type of plant. Uh, it makes it a lot harder. But at the end of the day, you, you're tr- you're trying to I think separate the the difference between the legal products that you can sell online and then the different laws and legalities in your individual state. So what I do, you know, my pro- my my company is based in California, but I'm actually located in Austin, Texas. So. You know, the things that we can sell in California may be different than the things that we can sell in Texas. And I think you just every company has to take those things into consideration right now. That's very true. That's very true. Now, you mentioned you have had work with, you know, Kettleball uh, organization as well. What was your first business that you started as an entrepreneur? Um, My first business that I started, I actually started two companies at once. One was Kettlebell Kings, which is the the fitness company. Um, But I kind of started that with... um, two friends of mine and I, and I wanted that to be a lifestyle brand. You know, I really wanted to build a community around that. I didn't see that as some, you know, patented product that was going to make us rich overnight. Um, so at the same time, I actually started a nail salon as well um, with my girlfriend. And we basically started that because, you know, I'd done some research, uh, wanted to move to Austin anyway. And that was one of the, the quickest kind of cash flow positive businesses that I'd done research on. And at the time, uh, my girlfriend was into actually doing nails. And so it was almost a, a perfect match. And so once I, you know, was, I was in corporate America, decided to kind of start my entrepreneurial journey. I knew I had to create a plan. And my initial plan was those two companies. So let's let's talk about the differences because they're two very unique markets, right? Yeah. You went from You went from really selling a product, right, to a consumable well, sometimes a consumable good. What yeah. are the similarities and what are the differences between those two kind of areas? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's major differences, you know, and I, I learned a lot from those kind of two different approaches. You know, with Kettlebell Kings, you're pretty much selling a commodity, if you will. You know, it's a it's a piece of cast iron. It comes from where everything else is going to be manufactured, which is typically China. You know, most of your cast iron is coming out of China nowadays. And then you're going to try to coat that with the best type of coating that you could. Um, and you're competing in a competitive space in, in, in the fitness equipment space. Um, and then you're also competing on a national level. And then, you know, you take the nail salon and you're now you're zooming in quite a bit and competing on a, uh, a much smaller geographical location and, and region. So your advertising is a little bit different, but then you're also selling services and you're, you're selling an experience versus a, you know, an online website or a digital uh, experience. And so learning from both of those different experiences really taught me uh, quite a bit. So there was a lot of overlap that I could learn from the two different ones, you know, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things or one of the ways I excel is really trying to build a brand and a sense of community around the people that purchase the service or the, the particular good. Um, with the nail salon, it was very similar. You know, we had cultish type following. And I think that's pretty much what any business has to really be going for nowadays is you know, if you don't have that kind of cultish following, if you don't have that brand along with the service or good that you're offering, I think you're just kind of holding that space until someone comes along that does. That's a great point. Now, one of the things, you know, you didn't mention, though, you, you played football at Rice, right? The University of Rice. Why entrepreneurship? I mean, that's, that's a good question. You know, I think when you, when you graduate from college, you, you everyone goes on that same journey of like, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Some of us are or fortunate enough to you know, know we want to be lawyers or firefighters when we when we're three years old. But for me, I always knew I wanted to be uh, part of a strong operation. You know, part of a team that I could be proud of the work that we accomplished. Um, you know, I think that that could really comes from my background in sports. I, I tell everyone my my favorite job I ever had was probably in construction because we actually got to complete projects and move on to another project and do that project faster than the previous project. So. It was, constant improvement and completion of, of things. And when I started excelling in the corporate America, uh, it was a lot less of that and more, you know, networking, more um, politics and kind of positioning yourself for the, for the position that you want to be in. And, you know, that's, that's not really fit. To, that doesn't really fit with my personality. I can, I can do it if I have to, you know, I'm a, I'm an intelligent human being, but I'm more, in my in my element if you will when i can actually be on small teams that are looking to complete projects and operations uh as as effectively as fast as possible entrepreneurship just matched up perfectly with that you know i can constantly um set up projects set up teams complete tasks and each building block that i put together you know leads to another kind of part of the puzzle or another uh step down the road if you will what would you say was one of the most difficult pieces of starting a company? The most, one of the most difficult pieces would, would probably be just what you not knowing what you don't know, you know, so you don't even know the right questions to ask. I think when you start a company uh, and I, you know, I think that's a difficult time. So I suggest, I tell everyone, like if you know someone that owns a company already, or if you, you know, you have a small network of people, take them out to lunch, just, you know, take them out for drinks, just literally try to get a sense of what it's like, you know, what the experience of owning uh, and handling the responsibilities of that, if that is, you know, there's a, you know, I tell everyone all the time, there's a different level of intensity of employee and ownership level that, you know, it's not the same level of uh, commitment, you know, when, when you own something, you know, you can think of it like a kid, you know, you, the, the teacher doesn't have to think about the kids when she goes home at night, but the parent is always thinking about it. And I think that's a good analogy for trying to prepare yourself for it. That's a great analogy. Now, what about easy? Is, has there been anything easy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I, I would say I wish. I think the easy <laughs> part, <laughs> yeah, I think the easy part for me is probably just the fact that it allows me to, to be competitive, you know, um, in some situations, if you're not really in sales or if you're not really in uh, a position at your job where you are competing on a regular basis, trying to get better, it can seem monotonous for me. Um, and in business, it's, it's never like that. You know, there's 
a thousand things that you could be doing and probably should be doing every day. And uh, every day you wake up, you can be getting better or something. You could be helping some other part of your business get better. So, you know, I really just like the aspect of having something that's, you know, like an ever growing organism that constantly improves. And, you know, it's something that uh, day in, day out, I can think about and, and constantly kind of tinker away at it. So, you know, it's, it's my uh, car, broken car in the garage sometimes, if you will. And it, it does bring me some, some joy that way. Now, why the pivot? You mentioned you were in the kettle uh, bells and now you're in the green space. Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, you know, with Kettlebell Kings, I think the, my partners and I built it up into a point where, you know, acquisition was being talked about both from, you know, internal and external parties. And so, you know, once we kind of decided to go the acquisition route, uh, I had already started Life Grows Green before we even made that decision. So it wasn't that um, it was going to be one or the other, but it did allow me to kind of focus more on this. And I, and I do think for my personal passions, you know, I've taken Kettlebell Kings uh, to the point where, you know, it's a, it's a global brand, you know, it's a well-recognized brand in space. And I'd like to do the same in, in the, the hemp, the cannabis space, in the, the natural product space, you know. I like to set an example of a company for people when they're thinking about how companies do it right. You know, I think a lot of companies get stigmatized into, you know, hemp or their cannabis products or just a replacement for stoners or, you know, they're, they're designed for recreational use only. And, I, you know, I, I want to really turn that on its head and provide, provide people with products that actually benefit their, their lifestyles and, you know, don't necessarily, uh, negatively affect the the culture or the their personal brands as well now what products are you going to be focusing on first in, in the hemp space so we have quite a few products right now i believe we have close to 30 products right now so you know everything that you, every type of cbd product that you can think of um, we do have um, protein powder so your natural hemp based protein powders um, we have peanut butter honey um, sports cream, salves. So, you know, really a variety of different types of products. I'm working on about 25 new products right now. Uh, like I say, everything from glass teapots to uh, sheets to sofa covers, you know, just anything that you can think of lifestyle that can be replaced with something that's made from something natural. Uh, that's, that's what I'd like to do. You know, I like when, when you look around your home, when you look around your kitchen, to replace as many of those products as we can with natural products that are sourced from the highest quality manufacturers in the world. You know, I see myself as the quality control for the community I've built and I just try to keep sourcing the best types of products for them. I like it. I like it. You know, one, one thing I would, if, if I can figure this out, I would be a billionaire, right? I want to try to figure out how to create anti-carbon furniture. So furniture yeah. I can have in your home, home but actually brings in and actually you know, remove some of that carbon, right? Yeah. That's, that'd be my dream. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. You know, that, yeah. that, that would be a billion dollar idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's possible. Now, how do you market this? Cause you mentioned you have issues because you do have that stigmatism with hemp and all these things. How do you market this? It's difficult. You know, you have to segment your product somewhat, you know, you have to segment, like I was saying before, from your state and local products to your, let's say, uh, federally legal products or uh, available to sell online products, if you will. And then, you know, you also have to do that when you're talking about advertising. So if something is named CBD, for example, that may be legal, but something named hemp is not illegal. And it's just a matter of, you know, changing the word and changing the marketing pitch for the potential products that, that fit people's advertising um, guidelines. But, you know, at the end of the day, everyone is having to juggle and complaining about these same things. So, you know, I try to see myself as an advocate for that as well. And, you know, I hope to, to build a community of people around who want to see these changes and kind of can build uh, some momentum, if you will, to, to, you know, push people in the right direction and say, hey, you know, this is not just a stoner movement. This is not just, uh, you know, this irresponsible culture shift that we're going through. This is some, this is kind of bringing us clear data and clear understanding of how to use natural products to live better lives. And, 
you know, it's not any more harmful and it's actually, you know, less harmful than any product, or especially pharmaceutical product or alcohol that's at, are already on the market. Now, who, who is the Life Grows Green typical con- consumer? Who, who's your target audience? I think it's, I mean, you know, I think customer, you know, CEOs or uh, marketing agents can say every, everyone can purchase it. And, you know, I think that is the general truth. But I, I do think it's a younger, a younger crowd that is, is really into kind of a more uh, thoughtful mindset when purchasing things. Uh, you know, I do want to change some of the, you know, older generations as well. But, you know, I, I think what, what I'm really going for is, you know, 25, I would say maybe 22 to 35, that, that crowd of people who believe that, you know, their purchasing power, the community that they build and the types of products they build can, can make a difference. You know, um, sometimes people think, you know, well, it's just a, it's just a plastic cup and you're right. It is just a plastic cup, but you're supporting that plastic company and you could be supporting, you know, a company that's actually trying to, to source high quality, you know, natural products or something that some company that's, that has a vision that you may believe in. So I don't really, um, limit myself, if you will, to the types of people that want to be involved. I try to set up different marketing angles and different products for the biggest community that I can. Uh, you know, even when you looked at Kettlebell Kings, like my previous company, people would ask us that question all the time. And we'd be like, well, you know, we have like 55 year old grandmas to do this. And then we also have like 21 year old meatheads. So it's not a, you know, it's not a kind of a, a one size fits all approach. I think it's more the small pockets or the small groups or communities that you build inside the larger community that that share that common thread of wanting natural products with their lifestyle. Yeah, you know it's it's, it's very interesting because I think you you kind of do hit a broad market. In fact, I mean, maybe this, maybe this is a dumb question, but how do you get hemp to be so diverse in so many different products? How how does that kind of process work? Um, just a lot of research. You know, it's a lot of R and D. It's a uh, you're talking about an emerging market, emerging products, emerging different uh, marketing approaches. So, you know, every new week you'll hear a new CBD, CBN, CBG, right? You'll hear some new derivative that, that you can take from the, the hemp or cannabis plant. I think it's, for me at least, and for, for Life Grows Green, I don't want people to get caught up in all of that, uh, you know, trying to become their own personal hemp experts and hemp and cannabis experts. I, you know, I like us to do all that research for you. And we really just try to provide you with the highest quality possible. So if there is, you know, if it's CBD, then we're going to try to provide you with the highest quality CBD. If it's uh, a salve, it's not a CBD salve that we're selling you. We're selling, it may have CBD in it, but we're, we're trying to provide you with the highest quality salve. And if it has CBD in it, great. If it doesn't, then that's also great. Um, and I think that's the way we really try to look at all of the product development we're doing is, you know, we're not trying to buy in or lean into those stigmas. We're actually trying to normalize, if you will, uh, a lot of the products that would, would otherwise be stigmatized. Now, you mentioned Sal, I think it was. What, what is that? Sal. So Sal is like a bomb or, you know, like a, a sports stick. You know, you, you'll see like... Uh, like an icy hot, you know, even like, so we have like sports creams and things like that. It's, it's basically something that can soothe the skin or, you know, soothe it, soothe as a topical, but then it all, it also can have, you know, joint or uh, healing, let's say benefits just because it has natural minerals and, and oils that your body may or may not, may or may not have, let's say. Now, what advice would you have for the listeners at home? or an aspiring entrepreneur? Um, do your research, you know. I think doing your research beforehand as an entrepreneur is the, the, one of the things a lot of people miss out on. You know, I, I, I think I tell people all the time, like if you don't actually want to learn about what you're, what you're doing, you know, you, you probably shouldn't do it. Like you, you should be the expert. You know, I believe that businesses that don't know what they're doing in a particular space are supposed to go out of business. So like I root for you to go out of business if you don't know what you're doing. And I think that's the way the world is operates the best. You know, no one wants a cell phone company that doesn't know what they're doing and no one wants a, you know, a a fitness company that doesn't know what they're doing. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, doing research. And then if you're talking about in in that preparatory or, you know, preparing for, uh, 
the journey of entrepreneurship, you know, I think it's huge to talk to other entrepreneurs that are already doing it and, and try to get that non-biased um, experience from them and, you know, just asking normal questions about what, it, what it's like. I don't think entrepreneurship is for everybody. You know, I, you know, I think it is trending right now where, you know, everyone thinks they can be a boss, but I don't, I don't know how the world works that way. Uh, but, at, you know, at the end of the day, I think you really have to prepare yourself for a different lifestyle than what you currently have. There's no guaranteed checks. There's no uh, comfort when it comes to entrepreneurship. It really is kind of the, you know, the ultimate risk of your, your own financial well-being. Yeah. Great, great point. You know, I, I got to admit, I woke up this morning and uh, I've been trying to, I'm starting to learn business development. So I'm actually meeting with a couple of folks to talk about business development. And I'm, I'm in my current profession, right? I'm the president of the board of the national program doing like a lot of national speaking and all these things. And now I'm thinking to myself, well, why am I going to transition? And I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, might as well be the fucking best at it right? Might as well bust my ass and be the best at it. And so I'm trying to learn with people, hey, bring in other business developers. Tell me what you know, right? I, I want to learn yeah. from you. I want to figure it out. Because if you're going to do it, why not be the best, right? Yeah. And and I think that's where just my competitive background comes from, from playing sports where I don't, I always think you have to improve. You know, I, I tell people, uh, you know, like when you play football, it doesn't matter how how well you did the day before you go and you watch film of the things that you messed up on every single day. You know, that's a, that's a constant rotation. So even if you did great things at practice, you may watch it for a split second, but you spend most of the time watching what you did wrong the day before, what you did wrong in the game before. And my mind is kind of naturally like that. So I, you know, I take that same approach to business where I actually like that constant improvement and the constant challenges of, you know, of new obstacles that we have to overcome as a team and, uh, the effort it requires and, you know, the, the joy it brings when, when we actually achieve those things. So uh, to me, you know, business is my new kind of competitive playing field, if you will. I like it. And, you know, the folks that listen to the show, I've, I've said this quite often. I've, I've never failed a day in my life. I either learn or I succeed. There you go. Yeah. Every day. Now. So for the listeners at home, where can they find your information? Where can they find you online? What is your website, social media information? Sure. Uh, if you're looking to contact me directly, uh, I'm on all socials, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Chad Price or Real Chad Price. And then, you know, if you're looking for any type of business stuff, you can find it on my, my Chad Price website. But then also uh, my company, Life Grows Green, all social channels as well. LifeGrowsGreen.com for, you know, any types of products, natural lifestyle products. You sign up for our mailing list. We, you know, we'll kind of notify you of the different types of products and we even crowdsource a lot of things we do. So, you know, we ask the customers and, and kind of the community that we build what types of products they're interested in. So if you're just interested in being part of a community of like-minded individuals who want to support natural products, join up and join me at Life Grows Green. I love it because you're talking about community, you're talking about support. In fact, that's a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter, which will have Chad's information, including Life Goes Green. So please go ahead and visit the shadesofe.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. You'll have all this information on there again. Uh, we'll put this information. Chad, is there any last words you have for the guests or for the listeners? Not yet. I am, like I said, I was telling you at the beginning, I'm about to publish my first book. So uh, that'll be at the end of the summer. So stay tuned for that. But you'll, you'll see that on my websites and on my social channels as well. But I'm excited about my first book coming up. And you know what, fact, make sure you send it over to me and I'll get it on the newsletter. Another reason why you should subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. Chad Price is going to be coming out with the book and I'll have that information sometime later this summer on the newsletter. Chad, thank you again so much for taking the time. Life grows green. I'm going to have to check it out because I'm, I am I feel like, again, Oregon it seems like that's where the, the Oregon, especially Oregon, uh, has a pretty big, uh, you know, hemp, hemp fields out here. So it seems it's a consumable good. Consumable goods are great from an entrepreneurship perspective, right? That's kind of, you, you certainly want something that people are going to consume and come back and need, need again. And that's kind of the hemp product sometimes. So I'm really interested to learn more about it. Chad Price, Life Grows Green. Thank you again so much. For those listening, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.